Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Howdy, y'all. My name is Mark. I'm an alcoholic. It's, uh, it's always so funny to see you guys. Hey, I'm, I'm never surprised when somebody comes and sees me. I'm always really surprised when somebody comes and sees me again. It's like, it's like, it's like that old dating thing. It's getting the first date's not the big deal. It's getting the second date that's always the problem. You know, I grew up not being able to get a date unless I had a shotgun in my hand. I just <laughs> did. Um, it's such a pleasure to see some of you guys, and you guys that were in this meeting earlier, uh, God bless you, to sit in a meeting for an hour and then sit in another one. I, I, I'm, I'm really torn here. I'd like to talk for an hour, and I know what your butt must feel like right now, and I go, I'll, I'll, how about 20 minutes? How about 10 minutes, and maybe you can stand this stuff? But we'll see We'll see how it goes. Um, I don't want to be redundant. There's some of the stuff that I'll talk about this tonight. Um, I, to be honest with you, I expected 10 of you. I, I thought there'd be ten people here, and I thought, well, you know, I can, I, with as many guys that are here, though, there's some things that we talked about last night that I really want to talk about tonight, because uh, we may not have a chance to get hooked up again anytime soon. That flight, oh, man, you guys need to figure out a way to move this beautiful country closer to the state. <laughs> oh, that's a trip, man. I'm telling you, it's a trip. And when your butt's as skinny as mine is, it's a trip. It is like a trip to die here. Um, for those that I haven't met, I um, I sobered up in January um, the 15th, of 88, and um, and I and and I love this deal from the moment I got here. And I, th- things were rosy for a long time in AA, and it's it like. The, the, we got 21 meetings a week in that group that I sobered up in in Louisville, Texas. And then 21 meetings a week, and there's 21 discussion meetings, and, and we discussed, and we did all the stuff. And, and, and I, I work real close to it, so I'm there a lot, and, and, it's, and it's great. And, you know, coming from a fallen down drunk that did Tosex full of those outside issues, uh, to not doing all that crap is great. It, I mean, just not drinking is great stuff. <laughs> But some of you guys that have been around for a while, you know what I'm getting ready to say. There's this, there's this place that we find ourselves when all of a sudden we wake up one day and just not drinking is not enough. Um, there's a thing called a spiritual malady that we'll talk about that begins to rekindle itself and we get really... We, you ever wonder why it is that statistically the largest number of people killing themselves in the world today are people in 12-step recovery programs? That's a fact. That's a fact. Because you've got so many people that are trying to treat this internal condition, which is alcoholism, with an external set of circumstances. If I can just manage well, if I can just get the job, the girl in the car, if I can just get, I just need the bigger house. I'll be, you know, I'll be cool. I'll move out of this burnout trailer and I'll go live in this big house and everything will be great. And then I get in the big house and it's, it's not great. The internal condition, which is alcoholism, still kicks my rear end. And, and that's the reason why we got so many, so many women in, in this thing dying, and so many elderly in this thing dying, and so many young guys that come and stay for a little while and they just drift off. You see, and so we'll talk a little bit about that stuff. I, I, I gotta, I gotta make sure that you guys are really clear on this thing like this. I didn't come from the United States to spank anybody. And somebody said, you know, <laughs> not sexually. I mean. It's like, <laughs> My reputation has preceded me. We're not going to talk about sex with animals either, but I'm going to... <laughs> they don't call us curverts for nothing. I mean, it's just like, I was raised in a little town called Kerrville, and it was like, oh, never mind. What is, what is... <laughs> it was... Hi everybody, my name is Mark Bramer and I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> we'll need to restart this over real quick. Um, sometimes people say, you know, you make me feel real uncomfortable when you talk, we need you to come talk to our group. And I'm going, well, I don't want to make anybody feel uncomfortable. I just, I just, you know what our area needs is we just need a big old spanking. And I'm going, then ask somebody else. But I don't want to spank anybody. And I don't want to make anybody feel uncomfortable about anything. However, that said, 
I want you to understand that my story is steeped in uncomfortable stuff. I'm, 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 and so I can't say, I can't talk about story stuff without talking a little bit about that other stuff. And if it makes you uncomfortable too, well, God bless you. I'm glad you're here. And, and I hope that, that it's out of this discomfort, this feeling that maybe I'm drifting sideways here, that things begin to happen, that, that we begin to make changes. You ever walk into an AA club and everybody's just sitting there all grim and everybody's just kind of looking at each other and nobody's smiling and nobody's happy and nobody is feeling anything like any kind of recovery. They're just, the book calls it a veil of tears and we're not, that's not what this thing is about. We're not supposed to be here all beat up. Now listen, let me tell you something. Would I rather sit in this room in a veil of tears situation or be out there on the street drinking? Yeah, I'd rather be in here like that. I mean, it's still better than you know, I mean, if I'm not drinking, then that means I'm not, I'm not taking a swat at my wife, and I'm not being brutal with my kids, and I'm not terrorizing my employees. It, you understand what I'm saying? I mean, if, if, if I can get some better, it's better. The problem is, is that Bill and Bob in those first 100, they understood that there was so much more. There was just, crap, guys, there was just so much more to recovery than what a lot of us do. And so, and I'm speaking collectively, okay? I'm talking worldwide what we do, you see? So uh, imagine this situation. I'm going to five or six meetings a week in this club, and I'm, I'm getting better. It's like if there's a bell curve, I'd be good. Better, 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 better. Steady, 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 steady. Dropping off, dropping off, miserable, miserable. And now back over here, I'm four years into this gig, and I'm, and I'm, I sit in a meeting, and I'm looking around the room, and I'm judging you, and you fat pig, and you're, and you loud mouth, and, 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 and why do we, have, she's sharing about her divorce for the thousandth time that week, and we're just, every meeting, there she is. Well, I really need to share about my divorce today, and I'm just going like, oh, please, please. I'm coming apart at the seams. Now listen, is it their problem that I'm coming apart at the seams? No. It's my own spiritual malady that's kicking my butt, but I'm not treating it because I don't know how to treat it. I don't know what to do. And the only the only direction I can get from the members of my group is, well, you just need to make some more meetings. And I'm just hop, I'm just hopping that. I'm just going, crap, guys, how many meetings do I have to go to to get clear of this stuff? How many meetings does it take to recover? One, ten, twenty, a hundred? How many? We teach the new guy that if he manages well, he can stay sober. That's what we teach him with the nonstop discussion meetings that we have in, in the States. You guys seem to be much healthier here than most of the groups I'm associated with, other than my own home group. But a lot of the places that I travel, guys, you'd be blown away. We could talk for three hours about crap I've seen in AA that goes on, that passes for AA, and everybody just sits back and smiles at each other and says, well, everything is fine. Trust me, guys, everything is not fine. Collectively, as a fellowship, we are not growing anymore. We're not, people are not staying sober. Of all the people that come to AA, you know what? Uh, statistically, less than 10% make it one year. Of all of the people. You ever wonder how many people are coming? In Houston alone, in Houston, Texas alone, 30,000 people a year would come to AA. And less than 3,000 would make it one year. Two-thirds of all those people are gone in the first 90 days. And we still have tens of thousands of people in meetings saying, well, meeting makers make it. 90 meetings in 90 days. You see? Where do we get this stuff? Keep saying it if you want to say it. But let me tell you something, guys. It's not doctrine and it's not in our literature and it doesn't mean anything. Because we all know that, guys, we can die. Here I am, four years sober, sitting in my meetings, doing everything I'm being told to do. And I'm getting sicker and sicker by the day. My family is terrified of me now. They don't know who's coming home. You ever leave a meeting and you feel okay? You're kind of at a place spiritually and you're feeling okay? And then the spiritual malady kicks your butt before you get home and you walk in the door and all of a sudden, ah, book bag right there in the front door and you got to step over that like this, like this. And by the time you get to the end of the hallway, you're just a nutcase. <laughs> there are manifestations of the spiritual malady that kicks your rear end. That's why... But see, the... <laughs> it's got nothing to do with what you drink or what you don't drink. It doesn't get, it doesn't make any difference how long you've been sober. I don't care if you've been sober. I, some of the most miserable men I've ever seen in my life are guys who've been sober 40 years. <laughs> I mean, they're powder dry, but they're so 
angry and so fearful inside. Everything, every piece of the spiritual malady is back again full force. And these men are like I was, terrified. Holy cow, is this all there was to life? Is this veil of tears, this horrible existence that I live? Horrible. Yeah, Bill and Bob and those cats knew exactly what we needed to do, and they had a plan of action that was based in a spiritual set of principles called the 12 steps, and all we had to do was work the 12 steps with a sponsor who had a spiritual experience and have our own personal experience. And yet we've got thousands and thousands of men and women who came in here, got hung up in the fellowship into the deal, and stayed. It's fun, and it's better than being a drunken bum. And God bless you, if that's where you are, I'm not judging that. I'm just saying there's so much more over here. The program of Alcoholics Anonymous that was so clearly written in the book. That's where I... See, so that's where I am. So I'm at four years sober, I'm, I'm going nuts. And I and hang on. I love that home group. I love those people. The kindest, most gentle people on the face of God's green earth were in that meeting. And they loved me and I love them. And I can't believe that this thing is falling apart. Four years drift into five years, five years drift into six years. By the sixth year of this thing, I'm suicidal. I'm writing hot checks all over Denton County. I can't keep my hands off other women, which just thrills my wife no end. I get it. All of a sudden, all of a sudden, my, my family is just this cesspool of life. Nothing has changed except there's not a 12 pack of Corona in my refrigerator. You see what I'm saying? Nothing has changed. I'm still an animal in my own family. And it shouldn't be like that. But it was. One night I, I was at a at a at a place there in in uh, Lake Dallas and uh, it's a beer store and I just kind of checked out in front of this beer cooler and some lady's tapping me on the back and she says hey are you going to get something or not and I and I just kind of it just kind of I don't know how long I've been standing there but it's long enough to pack her off and I had no business being in there I went in there to buy cigarettes I went in there to buy milk I wouldn't. I was in there to buy beer I'm standing right in front of this beer cooler and I just kind of checked out and glazed over. And it was such a weird feeling. I just kind of backed out like this, and I, it scared the spit out of me. I mean, I'm, I'm, there I am. There, I'm ready to drink, and it just caught me so completely off guard. The only thing I could think of was that ease and comfort. It's a funny thing. I haven't had a drink for seven years, and yet the thought of a beer is that it's just the most seductive. I'm, I'm unhappy at work and unhappy in my home life and unhappy with everything in my life. I hate you. I hate them. I hate everybody. And I'm thinking, if I could just drink a quart of beer, I'll be back on the Guadalupe River down in the hill country, standing there between them big cypress trees, and the moon will be out, and the wind will be blowing like this, and I'll have me this little babe right here like this, and I make a quart of beer like this, and it's just like... When did that happen? <laughs> when, I'm six, when I was 16 years old, when the booze worked beautifully. But there's where my head goes, you see. There's no rationale around any of this stuff. So anyway, I call Chris. Chris, Chris, the evil twin, Chris. You'll meet him one day and you'll know. <laughs> Chris has now moved. He, he doesn't work for me anymore. He's moved to the Hill Country. He's married this little gal, and he's got a big book guy for a sponsor. And he called me, and we talked a little bit about the stuff. And I'm I'm kind of putting some distance between Chris. And he's starting to sound like one of those a thumper kind of guys, and I'm just kind of like, yeah. It's a weird this arrogance that we carry into this deal, this ego thing that tells us that we got to, you know, we're I, I'm suicidal. I'm, a, I'm crazier than a crap house rat, and yet I want to judge Chris because he's got a big book sponsor. Does that, not, does that not sound weird to you? And yet I've watched men and women do it thousands of times over the last 13 years. I've watched, I've watched thousands of people do the exact same thing. I don't want to go over there. Those are, those are big book guys. <laughs> you mean the big book guys that are over there laughing their asses off and having a great time? Those guys? You get what I'm saying? It's just weird. It's just this, this arrogance is just amazing. And I and so I, I I called Chris and I told him I was in trouble and he said, Hey, you know, uh, I'll get you hooked up. And he did. He showed up in in, in Dallas uh, a couple of days later, and, and he got me hooked up with this crusty guy named Cliff Fisher. And and I and I go see him, and he carries me through the work again, and and and. And pretty much all is right with the world after that, except that I had two years transition between my middle of the road group, my six meetings, six discussion meetings a week, to this big book group. 
where we have three meetings a week and they're all literature based and we don't discuss anything. We don't give a rat patootie what your experience was around the step. We don't care. All I care about is what Bill Wilson said about the directions in the big book. And so I'm going from where I was to where these guys are and I, it's a bloodbath. I mean, I'm, I'm fighting it. I'm fighting it tooth and nail. It's like we were talking about this stuff last night. It's like, it's like, the group is set up and running. These are healthy people that are doing exactly what they're supposed to be doing. They're understanding what they need to be doing around 12-step work and the rest of this stuff. It's a real active kind of group. And and uh, and but I still want to share all my wisdom that I've been spoon-fed in AA for all these years. And so so that every time they have an opportunity, they're they're I'm raising my hand. I'm wanting to call on me so I can share this wisdom. And it's just it's, it's lame. And finally one day, it is. And so one day, we're sitting, we're sitting around this table like this, and, and, um, and I'm looking at people's faces, and I go, and I look at his eyes, and I look at her eyes, and I'm going, shit. It was just a just, just absolutely dramatic kind of a thing. It's just real still in the room, and I'm looking at them, and I'm going, they're all different. I'm different. And after that meeting, I walked up to Clifford and I said, Hey, uh, Cliff, um, I'm still different from you guys, aren't I? And he said, Yeah, no, no kidding. You finally realized. <laughs> and I said, well, well, what do I have to do? And I remember he kind of looking at me and he was kind of like I'd, he, I mean, it's like he's going, Are you, are you that stupid? <laughs> and I kind of go, I guess I am, Cliff, because I don't, I don't. And he said, you know, I've been telling you for two solid years what you need to do to get clear of this stuff, and yet you simply won't do it. Okay. I go, well, tell me again. <laughs> and he did. He said, I'll tell you what, I'm going to make a deal with you, Mars. He said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you what you need to do, and then if you don't do it, I want to see you gone. And I said, oh, you mean to, from the meeting tonight? And he said, no, 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 I don't want to ever see you over here again. <laughs> this is my sponsor. <laughs> One more time, I'm going, hey, Cliffo, where's the love, brother? Come on, man. <laughs> man. I was in a kumbaya kind of mood here, and you're trying to, I'm still in my gut view, you, and you're telling me, guys, you, you, you get the picture by now. They just had a crawl full of Myers Raymer. They got a crawl full of my arrogance. They got a crawl full of my ego. They got a crawl full of my feel good, middle of the road, stupid, uh, AA. And that's all I had to offer was that. That's all I had to give you was the crap I've been fed in meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous by people that love me to death. Meeting makers make it. Make, that's all I know. I'm too lazy to read the big book. Guys, you know, it took me a while to get clear of this stuff. But for a while, I wanted to resent that old group. I wanted to go, why didn't those bastards show me what I was supposed to do? You know what? Why didn't I just get off my lazy rear and read the book? Why didn't I just go get me a good, solid sponsor that had had a spiritual experience as a result of doing this work and let him carry me through the deal? Oh, no. You don't want to do anything that might make me feel uncomfortable. And there it was. I got exactly what I sowed. And it was just a, it was just ugly. So Cliff made me go do some 12-step work and everything changed. That's it. I mean, that's the bottom line on the whole deal. Um, and as a result, everything about my whole perspective shifted. Um, we're going to talk about this stuff at the conference tomorrow afternoon, this 12-step stuff, the stuff that you guys were covering tonight in that meeting. Um, the guys that weren't in the conference last night, let me, let me mention something real quick. The, the guys go, you know, I, I go to this meeting and I've been going every year for the, to this same meeting and, and it's all great and everybody's staying sober and everybody's fine. Guys, I, I wish that was true everywhere, but it's not. The world is full of mainstream, middle-of-the-road, watered-down, goofy AA where people just come and hang out. It's all about the fellowship. It's all about the domino game. It's all about the dance. It's all about the... It's all about the Everything except recovery. Everything except this, about this guy that's detoxing in our meeting. We don't have time for this man's detox because we're too busy listening to her inability to get a job and she wants to share all the stuff that she's going through, blah, blah, blah. And we go through it time and time again. Let me ask you a question. Just one straight up question. How many of you guys... i got to get rid of this coat. Sorry. I'm, I'll, I'm, I won't make it. Okay, i got to get rid of these <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I got, I got carried away. How many of you guys have been 
have been in a meeting. Let's say you walked into a discussion meeting and you were sitting there and the, the chairperson came prepared. He had a topic and you, 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 just, you heard the topic and you went, yes, yes, yes. Okay, this is groovy. And you kind of relax and you think this is going to be swell. And he opens the meeting, a little, little gets it all greased up for us. And the next guy that chairs does a perfect job of staying on track. We're, we're in the work. Every, everybody in the room's moving lockstep through the stuff. And then there's one guy. He goes, the next guy to share goes, well, um, you know, uh, uh, my name is Richard and, uh, and I'm a alcoholic and a drug addict. And, um, uh, and I gotta tell you, and I gotta tell you, uh, about my, um, whatever. You fill in the blank. I, my mother-in-law's coming over tomorrow and I'm really scared. And I know the topic tonight was step three. But I really need to share this. And you watch everybody in the room just go, it's like they had big stoppers in their butts and they went poo like this and pulled it out and you watch them just wither in the seat. Everybody just sits back like this because you know you're in for it. Richard's going to share about his fear of his mother-in-law coming there like this and nobody will step up to the plate. Now, the new guys in the room and the guys that are in trouble in the room are all going, please, somebody stop this. Please, somebody stop this. <laughs> But in the name of guy of, 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 of love and tolerance, we're going to let him share. And share. And share. <laughs> you see what I'm saying, guys? You've all been there. I want to submit one thing to you guys. Just one. Where is it in loving and tolerance behavior that Richard's right to share that crap overshadows this detoxing man's right to hear a clear-cut message out of the big book. Where is that? I, I, it, it's, it's a question that we all have to ask ourselves, guys. This all comes back to, to, to fiscal responsibility around AA. This has to come back to where, where are, is our primary purpose? My primary purpose is to carry a clear-cut message to the alcoholic who still suffers. He's detoxing sitting in my meeting. He can't hold a coffee cup. And yet we're going to sit there and listen to Richard talk about this stuff. Instead of the chairperson going, Richard, that's fascinating. Why don't you come see me right after this thing and we'll talk about that. Because right now we've got a guy in here that's having some struggles and we desperately need to get him through this work. How about Is that cool? And Richard will go, yeah, that's fine. Or, or maybe Richard will go, well, screw you. It's not fine. I want a place to share. At which time I would say, Richard, see ya. See you. Because your selfishness and self-centeredness may kill this guy right here. And he's the man I'm worried about. Not your selfish and self-centered rear. Go call your sponsor. Get, get out of here. <laughs> now, some of you guys go, well, that's pretty hard-nosed. Well, I know it is. But you know what, guys? Having him go back out on the street tonight and, and drink again is pretty rigid, too. You understand what I'm saying? And in all these years of doing this stuff, guys, it, it doesn't... I don't want to make this, I don't want to paint this picture that this happens in every meeting that you go to. But it happens often enough that we need collectively a bunch of people that are, that are understand the literature and understand the work clear enough and concise enough that they're willing just to say, you know, buddy, uh, why don't we share that with your sponsor? See, there was the avenue that it was originally designed. If you go back and look at Clarence Snyder's memoirs, you go back and you read uh, uh, AA Comes of Age, look at Dr. Bob's stuff like this, all of them point in the same direction. Every one of God's kids needs a place to share their stuff. Trust me on this. I'll never make... We all got problems and we all have things we need to share. And there was an avenue for doing that. It was called sponsorship. Call your sponsor. But taking up valuable recovery time in a meeting, talking about how bad your day was... Does it? God, AA is not therapy. AA may be, a discussion meeting may be therapeutic in nature. It may feel better to dump that stuff. But it is not therapy. Once again, we find ourselves in a position where we're trying to treat an internal condition with an external deal. How many of you guys have ever walked into a, to a, a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous about a relationship problem and you said, well, I'm having this problem with my boyfriend and blah, 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 blah. Now, you're sitting in a meeting with 15 or 20 men and women who haven't had a decent relationship in their whole collective <laughs> life. And we're going to, and we're going to ask them for advice about my relationship. Is there anything crazier than that? I mean, 
<laughs> if I'm having, if I'm having, tr- I'm not making light of any of that, guys. But if I'm having trouble with a relationship, you know what I'm going to go do? I'm going to find an old member of my group who has had an experience with a, with a, with a, a wife for a bunch of years and knows a, something about a relationship. And then I'll call him and I'll say, "Hey, buddy, I'm having trouble. Can you talk to me for a few minutes?" He said, "You bet. Better still, I'll get my wife to talk to you too." And now I got. There it is, big old bookend standing right there, keeping me on track where I need to be. Instead of a bunch of people sharing stuff they don't know any about. We got a fellowship full of junior therapists, junior attorneys, junior physicians, everybody wanting to just share a bunch of crud. Quit it! I'm not a doctor and I don't know how you're going to handle your meds. Let's go find you a physician to find out what's going on. I'm not an attorney. I don't have a, I don't have any idea how you're going to handle your, your bankruptcy. Why do we want to take up an hour talking about your bankruptcy when we don't know? We're not attorneys. Let's go find you an attorney. Please, I'll help you. Let's go do that. You see? All this is to say, guys, please, I'm not, I'm not, all this is just to say is that we have a finite amount of recovery time. We have just these little precious moments in the week that we can all come together and get all gathered up and get all warm and fuzzy together and help this goofy kid get through the work <laughs> so that he knows what's going on. Listen, guys, you know what makes me weep the most in AA today is this thing about people coming into our fellowship that have been here for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, and still are ambivalent about their disease. They don't understand. They still to this day do not understand why they drink. Now, he goes, well, that's his right. Whatever he wants to do. Terrific. Super. But guess what? At some point in time, this guy that doesn't understand his disease is going to be asked by this man to sponsor him. Mm-hmm. And now we've got this guy over here that doesn't understand why he drinks. He doesn't understand his disease. He doesn't understand the program of recovery, even in its basic form. Meeting makers make it. You see what I'm saying? And this guy over here, he may be helped by that stuff for about... A week? <laughs> and then as the spiritual malady rekindles itself and he begins to unravel, he gets twisted around the axle, and then he looks to his sponsor and he goes, Oh, okay, I'm, I'm ready for some help here. And then he goes, Well, I don't. And the anxiety that that man feels, this sponsor guy, the anxiety that he feels is the same anxiety that is shared by every one of us in this room at some point in time. The common thread among every one of us in here is this that we're getting ready to talk about. Let's say for the sake of this example that we've all been sober one year. we got one year of sobriety. Goofy here comes in and he needs a sponsor. <laughs> I love you, brother. Honestly. <laughs> He's got Goofy written all over him. I'm telling you. <laughs> So, you know, I need a new ride back to Melbourne. Guys. He goes, so, so here, here's the situation. We're all a year sober. He comes in, sits in the meeting like this. Now, now we're all sharing in the, in the meeting, and Goofy's looking at me. And you know what? You know, you know the look. It's this 100-yard stare, and he's looking right at you, and he's down there like this, and he's looking right at you, and you're going, oh, God. Please don't look at me, because you know what he's going to do. As soon as the meeting's over, he's going to walk over there, he's going to uh, like this, and he heads right to you like this, and he says, hey, my name's Goofy, and uh, I really would like you to be my sponsor. And, co- and, co- and collectively, we all seem to be in exactly the same kind of situation. There's a part of us that's elated by the fact that somebody finally asked us to sponsor him, and there's another part of us that's going, oh, damn, why did I choose that moment to go to the bathroom? <laughs> Because the, re- the reality is, guys, I don't want to sponsor you. I don't want to sponsor you because I don't know how to sponsor you. I'm afraid I'll hurt you. I'm afraid. And there's this, there's this big old load of anxiety that, that rears its ugly head. And that's the reason why you have so many great guys coming in and they get hooked up with guys. And the first thing the guy does is say, well, I want you to read the big book and um, read the 12 and 12. And uh, maybe I'll see you in a meeting in a week or two. Guy like this. I mean, we just, them. We just want to get them gone. You know, like maybe they'll get drunk out there and they won't come back. I hope. <laughs> but wouldn't it be better, play this scenario out, wouldn't it be better if every, if every one of us took the responsibility for our own recovery, gathered up the big book, got hooked up with a sponsor who had a spiritual experience, and had him help us back through the work again? All of us are already at a year sober, okay? But at a year sober, we ought to know where we are in the work. We ought to know where we are in conjunction with a spiritual experience. If the spiritual experience is there, good. If it hasn't, let's get it. 
I don't care if you've been sober one week or 20 years or 50 years. It doesn't make any difference. The assessment must be made. It must be made. And for no other reason than if you don't make the assessment, you'll miss the best part. You'll miss all the, all the groovy stuff. You will. That's it's why to these days I sponsor more guys that are retreads than guys that are, are in jeopardy 17, 18, 19, 21, 22 years like this that, that, are, that are out there. These are most of the guys that I sponsor these days that i got a, I got a slug of them that I'm working with right now. And, and they, 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 they're full of arrogance and they're full of, well, I've been sober 25 years. I know. But you're, you're miserable, aren't you? Yeah, I am. Well, super. How about we go back to the work? I already did the work. Oh, okay. So this is where you tell me about you're trying to maintain an experience today based on an experience that you had 25 years ago. Come on. The book is alive. The work is alive. The, the stuff that we do is alive. You, you may have had a spiritual experience 25 years ago, but you know the book has a reoccurring theme of rekindling and reworking through this stuff so that we can maintain that deal. Work and self-sacrifice for others, does that sound familiar? If we're not in the trenches in the service area of this deal, if we're not in the trenches carrying a message to Goofy here, we're never going to stay sober. And it, we may stay clear of the booze, but we'll never stay sane. We'll never stay the place that we want to be. And yet we have a fellowship out there of tens of thousands strong telling us to take our time to work the work. Oh, it's no race. Don't do this. Don't do this. Oh, you're, you're not ready to sponsor that guy. Listen to this. You'll get a kick out of this. Maybe not. <laughs> ah. This is came out of when AA came, came to age. It was soon evident that the scheme of personal sponsorship would have to be devised for the new people. Now, each prospect was assigned an older AA who visited him at his home or in the hospital, instructed him on AA principles, and conducted him to his first meeting. But in the face of many hundreds of pleas for help, the supply of elders could not possibly match the demand. Brand new AA, sober only a month or even a week, had to sponsor alcoholics still drying up in the hospital. <laughs> guys, I got guys that have been sober 10 years and still hadn't sponsored one man. There's, listen, there's nothing that separates us from this thing, guys. Left on my own devices, I'll never be smart enough, I'll never be quick enough, I'll never be sharp enough, I'll never be whatever it takes to be a sponsor. I'm not him. I can't do it. Left on my own devices, I'll always sell myself that bill of goods, and so will you. Laying in your bunk at night, you'll go, man, maybe next year. As soon as I get the job thing worked out, as soon as she comes back, and as soon as all this other stuff gets worked out, then I'm going to go do some of that 12-step work. I'm promising you. You ever go into a group like this and you announce a 12-step gig that's happening at the end of the week? Friday night we're going out to Salvation Army. We need a bunch of guys to come with us out there to open up this little book study that we're going to do out there like this. And, and after the meeting, you get this guy walks up to you and he goes, oh, you know, are you talking about this Friday, right? And I went, yeah, this Friday. Oh, well, yeah, I can't do it this Friday, but hey, maybe next Friday. <laughs> maybe, maybe next Friday. And you hear it thousands of times, guys. Thousands of times. If there is a secret handshake in Alcoholics Anonymous, it's in 12-step work. That's, it. That's, that's the whole deal. It's the, it's the uh, Bill Wilson thought it was important enough that he wrote a whole chapter working with others just on that stuff. Tonight, when you guys were reading um, Step 12 in the deal, listen to this. I have a guy that I'm sponsoring that's 17 years sober right now, and the other night we were sitting in a book study like this, and he says, are the steps written down anywhere in the big book? <laughs> I'm lying, I'm dying. <laughs> Crazy some bitch. <laughs> 12, having had a prison waiting as a result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to alcoholics. And you guys were studying the last half of this thing, I think, tonight. Having had a spiritual awakening, that's a question there, sort of, it's the way it posed. Have we had a spiritual awakening as a result of doing these steps? And if we have, great. And then it tells us we tried to carry this message. What was the message that we were trying to carry? That we had a spiritual awakening as a result of the work. That was it. And so the two questions that got to be asked is, have I had a spiritual awakening? If I had checked, mark it off the list. And then your next obligation is to go carry that message to the recovering alcoholic. It didn't say... Having had a screwed up relationship and needing to share that in a meeting, I would try, it didn't say that. The book tells us over and over and over again, page 44 at the bottom of the, the two things that they did to qualify the drunk. They told us that it was only, only something that a spiritual experience would cure. 
You can't talk your way into a spiritual experience. You could any more than I can talk myself into being a, a parent by going to PTA meetings. You can't do it. You go to a thousand PTA meetings and it's still not going to make you a parent. You see? You gotta be a parent. You gotta, you know, have babies. <laughs> Sorry, again. <laughs> you ever do things and just wish immediately afterwards you hadn't done it literally? A... <laughs> Listen to this stuff. We were talking last night about these meetings. We were talking about these meetings where they won't let you bring big books in the meeting anymore. This is in our area around Texas like that, and they won't, they won't let you bring big books in there because uh, they're going to talk about your day, so why do we need a big book? The, these, these places where you go where they're, they're, they're charging money to hear fifth steps now. This seems to be re- really big in Latino AA. It happened in other places too, but it's really big for some reason or another in Latino groups. Uh, and, but it's devastating to these guys. You know, people go, well, how much do they charge? And the, the answer to that, because I asked the question, the answer to that is, is how good a fifth step do you want? <laughs> I mean, really? I mean, so so you pay your way through this stuff. You know, if you listen real close, if you went just like this, you could hear Bill Wilson going, Arr! flipping over in his grave. You know what I mean? It'd be just, it, this is, listen to this. Um, last night, I, I couldn't sleep, and I was on the email stuff trying to get a hold of my wife and download a bunch of emails. And I got this email from this kid named uh, Daniel in Ireland that I sponsored. And... Um, <coughs> And he said, Myers, he said, we got a problem here. Let's see, a year ago they started a big book study there and these guys were flat ass on fire. They just made all kinds of changes in the Dublin area around AA stuff. They got a bunch of guys that really understand the book and they're real heavy in sponsorship. They're real heavy in 12 step work going out and, and the, 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 the booze, as you might understand, in, in Great Britain and in, and in Ireland is, you know, I mean, it's just kicking their rear ends. And these guys are like, but they've grown from two or three guys doing this stuff to 60 or 70 guys that are doing this stuff and they're just on fire and it's a, it's a, it, they ought to make a movie out of that little deal that happened there and the, they did the same thing in Great Britain and they've done the same thing in a bunch of other places and it's just amazing to see that stuff happen. But he sent me the page, a copy of the page out of the revised service handbook from Ireland <coughs> produced by their central office there and it said, at the bottom of this page, there's in parentheses, there's a little quote at the bottom and it says, regarding the big book study movement, this is an outside, this is outside the structure of Alcoholics Anonymous in Ireland. <laughs> outside the structure of Alcoholics Anonymous? These are men and women wanting to study the big book. Study the basic text so they'll know how to carry Goofy through the work. Is this? Last year I got one from from um, from Great Britain for, in London, the same kind of deal, and they got an email text from this cat, and he wrote it down and he just sent it to me on an email. It said, "My group, in accordance with intergroup discussions, will not be promoting your extreme cause. A few of my members have already had bad experience with your method and relapse. Leave us alone and do your recovered program elsewhere." Extreme cause? These are men and women studying the book. That's all they're doing is studying the book. And they want to isolate them and do the deal. So, so the, I mean, so the implied thing is, is as long as they're in there discussing Sally Sue's divorce for the thousandth time, they're within the confines of Alcoholics Anonymous. But the moment we sit over here and look at the 12 life-saving steps that were given to us, we're outside of AA? <laughs> Tell me Dr. Bob and Bill wouldn't crap in their mess kit if they heard this. they go, <laughs> Scratch that one. Sorry. You see what I'm saying? The, the, we read this last night for you guys that weren't there. An AA group as such ought not take on the personal problems of its members. Let me paraphrase this real quick. Bill Wilson, you guys understand the way that this stuff works. Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob, in the early days, every piece of information, good and bad, in AA came right back to Bill. It's a hell of a load. Can you imagine what it would be like for one man to stand there and hold all that responsibility and, you know, one day he's getting whacked up the side of the head because this isn't working on another day. He's getting accolades and he's making it sound like he's some god. and He's just, you know, he's, 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 he's guru status over here. He's a piece of crap over here. And it must have been like an emotional roller coaster. Somebody said one time, I don't understand why Bill Wilson was, was, was so depressed. Trust me, guys. I know exactly why Bill Wilson was, was, was depressed. I understand what he must have been going through. 
So, so in the 60s, this is, now Bob has been dead for, for several years now, and Bill writes this letter, uh, and it says, an AA group as such cannot take on all the personal problems of its members, let alone those of non-alcoholics in the world around us. The AA group is not, for example, a mediator of domestic relations, nor does it furnish personal financial aid to anyone. That's going to knock out about 60% of our discussion meetings right there, that kind of stuff. Though a member may sometimes be helped in such matters by his friends in AA, the primary responsibility for the solutions of all of his problems of living and growing rests squarely upon the individual himself. Now, should an AA group attempt this sort of help, its effectiveness and energies would be hopelessly dissipated. Now, here it is. That is why sobriety, freedom from alcohol, through the teaching and practice of AA's 12 steps, is the sole purpose of the group. If we don't stick to this cardinal principle, we shall almost certainly collapse. And if we collapse, we cannot help anyone. That's straight from the horse's mouth, guys. And yet we have we have tens of thousands of us that think that we're smarter than Bill Wilson, that we have a better plan for AA. Well, let me tell you something, guys. When the big, it, it, it's a forward to the second edition in 1950 something where they're talking about this stuff and they give you a little piece of history. Remember it? It's in the last page of the forward to the second edition. And they talk about 90 plus percent of the people that came to AA stayed in AA, walked free and clear as recovered alcoholics. And today, worldwide, we're doing less than 10%. So please, come see me after the meeting. Entertain me with your thoughts on why we're doing things so well today, guys. Statistically, we are not doing a decent job. These people, the problem has never been able to, it, it, getting people to come to us. You understand it, don't you? I mean, we, we, we're the last house on the block for a lot of people. The problem is not getting people to come. The problem is getting people to stay. And the problem is for us to stand here shoulder to shoulder as sober members of Alcoholics Anonymous and take the heat that we created. The Newsweek thing that most of you guys read on the internet and stuff like this, these, this, these de continued debacles in AA where people bust their anonymity and, and we're the butt of every AA joke. I mean, just every comedian in the world wants to take cheap shots at AA. And guys, I'd love, to, I'd love to get resentful and say they shouldn't be doing this, but you know what? we got to own this stuff, guys. We let it happen in our fellowship. We let it happen. You see? By now you know that I don't like discussion meetings. I think they're the worst thing that ever happened to AA. However, I'll tell you this. There's something good about discussion meetings. I don't think there's a soul in here. I, don't, I, don't, I bet there's not one person in here that hasn't gone to a discussion meeting that went the way it was supposed to go with a topic that was already decided on and a strong chairperson to hold the thing on track and didn't sit there and feel elated to be in that room. Just excited as we could be to be there discussing the things that we needed to discuss. And they're, they're magical when they work like that. The problem is, is that the format allows things to go south because we don't have chair people that are strong enough to hold things on track. And all I'm asking you to do, guys, in the Dallas Fort we're there, we've got 122 groups and we've got 1,500 discussion meetings a week. We have 25 literature based meetings. 1,500 discussion meetings, 25 literature based meetings every week. You, can, you, can, you can't take three steps in the city of Dallas or Fort Worth without stepping on an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting that has a discussion thing going on. It's a struggle to try to find a, a literature-based meeting where people could learn what they need to be discussing in the discussion meeting. And so all I'm asking is, the next time you have an opportunity, I go past asking. I'm begging. I'm down on one knee. I'm down on two knees. I'm, I'm begging you. The next time you're in a group conscious meeting and you have an opportunity to make a change in some of your meeting schedules um, to a literature-based meeting, please step up to the plate and make the suggestion. Let the informed group conscience of your group decide what the deal is. You may feel like the Lone Ranger in there. You may think you're the only guy that feels that way. Trust me, there's a sea of new people coming up through this deal, guys, and they are desperate for a solution. And most of these younger guys that are coming in sense that the solution is there. They sense that we're all on the right track. They're just frustrated that they're not hearing it. And so they hear tape, they hear CDs, and they hear all this other stuff, and they get all excited, and they go back into the discussion meeting, and they just get shot to shit. They get old-timers and guys that don't understand what's going on, want to whack them up the side of the head, and they say, hey, hey, you haven't been sober long enough to do this. You haven't... Come on, guys. This is about unity. I'm not talking about divisiveness. I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about raising up an army of big book Nazis out there whacking people upside the head and being divisive about this stuff. I'm a huge, huge fan of the traditions and I'm a huge fan of tradition one, which is all about unity. And if you go through and work through the traditions, you'll notice that every one of them seems to, seems to refocus us back to unity. Refocus us back to unity. It's always the same thing. And the cool part about that stuff is, guys, is that 
We talked about this some last night. I know some of you, there's nothing more offensive than a big book guy in a meeting that wants to spank guys with a big book. Well, you chicken chips don't know anything. My big book says, and then, and then everybody in the room just goes, click, and turns off. If that's what your big book does, I don't want any part of it. That's what everybody in the room is thinking. Rather than doing that, why don't we encourage people to come and study with us so that collectively we can all get smarter about what the book was all about. People go, well, all we got is our story. No, you don't. Come on, let's get it straight, guys. You, you have much more than your story. You have how you recover. You have how the book is set up. They talk, On page 17, remember, they talk about a common solution. Our stories are important. Her story and his story are hugely important in a 12-step call when you're trying to identify. This guy's 12-stepping him, and they're going to identify. They're going to talk a little bit, and all of a sudden he goes, yeah, you know, you understand, just like Bill and Bob did. Bob tried for years to get sober and couldn't. What finally happened? Bill came to see him, they identify, and Bob goes, here's a man that understands. That's when our story is important. But past that, guys, it become tedious. You know, they just become tedious. I know they're important to you. My story is important to me too. But we just go overboard with it. Instead of taking up the time in a meeting talking about my story and how I got here, why don't we talk about something really cool, like the step, you know? Something really cool about how God break my little you-know-what out of the fire again and set me on a path where I could have a, a, a rich and wonderful life. I mean, this is what this stuff is all about. Some of you guys know so well exactly what I'm talking about. You're already doing exactly that. You're already doing 12-step work. You're already busy in the trenches carrying the message of recovery to places you are. It doesn't mean the other guys are evil people. It doesn't mean you got, but it means that, that collectively, in unity, in, in, in connection with the common solution that they talk about on page 17, let's get all gathered up together and head down this thing together, shoulder to shoulder, all doing the same thing. That's what they really wanted us to do. The grapevine has got a great little little deal in here. I, I think I read that stuff last night. This thing that the grapevine put out like this, this will give you a cl- piece of clarity about why this thing is in such bad shape. The awareness that every AA member, this is the grapevine statement of purpose. <laughs> it is, it is, I just enjoy it every time. I read it three times a day just so I can laugh. <laughs> the awareness that every AA member has an individual way of working the program permeates the pages of the grapevine. And throughout its history, the magazine has been a forum for the varied and often divergent opinions of AA around the world. This is what we're up against, guys. This is what drives me crazy. We got we got all these people out there saying, "Well, it's anything you want to do is fine. It's a, it's all you know, it's all groovy." And then we have a quote from Dr. Bob in here where he says, people say that it's an individual program that we can take the steps any way we want to. Dr. Bob said, and I quote, there is no such thing as an individual interpretation of the 12 steps. There is no such thing as a personal interpretation of the 12 steps. Guys, your experience may be different than mine after you work the steps. It probably will be. I'm not saying that everybody has to be this, this, this a bunch of robots doing this thing, but the path to recovery Step 1 through step 12 should be identical. The way we work it, the time frame that we work it. We got half our fellowship out there telling you to take your time. We'll start the work in a year. We got, in, in, in Europe, they got this thing called the German system, and you don't work any steps for 160 days. Our literature on page 24 says that we won't remember with, with sufficient force the pain and suffering of even a week or a month ago. We're without defense against the first rain. What makes me think I'm going to make it 160 days? And if they were, if they just opened their eyes and looked, they'd see it didn't work in, boys. It didn't work in at all. These guys are getting brutalized by the disease because the, the, the spiritual malady rekindles itself. I got the spiritual, ma- the, the, the middle of session standing four square right there telling me that the problem doesn't exist. And I'm off to the races again. Time and time and time again. You got chronic relapsers in your group? Find out why. And I guarantee you it will always come back to the group. It will always come back to weak and effective sponsorship. We're not gathering the guys up. Most of the time that's what it is. We're not gathering them up and getting them into the work as quickly as we need to do that. I'll tell you this and then I'll shut up. Scouts on them. (laughs) In the last 13 years, I've sponsored hundreds and hundreds of men. I've carried jillions of guys through the work. And I've never taken more than 45 days to work that work. Never. Based on my experience in reading the literature, and based on my experience in reading the memoirs of Clarence Snyder and Dr. Bob and some of these cats that were doing this thing, 
trust me on this, guys. If, Bob, if Dr. Bob took 5,000 guys through the work in the time that he was at Towns Hospital, trust me on this, do the math, he didn't wait. That's what, what did it work out, two and a half, three guys a day while he was there? He didn't wait a year to start these guys through the work. And the only reason to tell a man to wait a year to do the work, I'm not being offensive. I mean, I may be offensive, but I'm not trying to be offensive. <laughs> the only reason for telling a man to wait a year to do the work is that we are in our own self ambivalent about what to do. We are not certain about the direction to take. And that should be our goal. Tonight when you go to bed, that ought to be our brand new mantra. Tomorrow, I'm going to set myself up here and I'm going to figure out exactly how to carry a guy through the work. And it's crystal clear. And I'll help you in a heartbeat. I'll, I have no problems at all spending time with you giving you the rundown on this stuff. And it starts with one nasty word. Qualifying. And I know it drives some of you guys nuts to think about that. But the early AA guys spent a good amount of time in the beginning qualifying these guys so they could help them understand whether they're a real alcoholic or not a real alcoholic. If I've got a guy that's ambivalent about his disease, he'll never make it through the work. You can't love him enough. People didn't love you enough to make you sober up. Pain made you sober up. You were so uncomfortable in your own skin that you were willing to submit to the work, and that's how you got here. We got a lot of guys here that aren't alcoholics in our fellowship, and you see them and you sit in meetings with them sometimes, and they say crazy things like, "You know what? I'm here 15 years, and I never did any of that work." <laughs> shut up! Uh, <laughs> serious. Shut up! Because you're killing people with that crap. The real deal alcoholic can't do that. The real deal little dope fiend can't do that. You won't have that kind of deal. But because we stopped qualifying people years ago because it wasn't loving and tolerant. We stopped asking them the questions that we need to ask. Our fellowship began to fill up with people who were not alcoholics. They were heavy drinkers that drink just like us. They came. They liked the women. They liked the coffee. They liked the fellowship. They liked the stuff. And we stayed, you see. And that's what we, what we need to do is get back to the stuff. Go to page 44 and read the first paragraph on page 44 of We Agnostics. And it tells us exactly how to qualify the new guy. We read them the paragraph and they'll go, uh-huh. <laughs> or they'll go, uh-uh, and have a crystal clear idea of where they are. It's that simple. It is. All right, I'm done. Scout on For any of you guys that hate my guts, I'm sorry. And I do love you. And I, and I, I <laughs> this is my experience based on talking to hundreds and hundreds of groups a year. This is my experience based on my own debacle in AA, my own misery in our rooms. And it may not be your experience. You may have come and stayed and loved it from the beginning, and you may still feel warm and fuzzy every time you walk in. And I pray that you do. I do. I genuinely hope that you never go through what I won't go through. But unless you submit to that process, unless you seek a spiritual experience with that kind of urgency, you'll never have the necessary power to effectively help a new guy and more importantly, from a purely selfish standpoint, you'll never know the joy and the peace and the absolute certainty that you're clear on your primary purpose. Guys, let's on our own devices. We're the most badly behaved people on God's green earth. We do all kinds of goofy things. We harm everybody that we know. And to come into a fellowship, work a few simple steps, and to be able to stand there and know beyond a shadow of a doubt what my primary purpose is, to carry a message of recovery to a drunk that still suffers is heady stuff. Heady stuff. An outsider would look at my life and say, Mark, I think your life is pathetic. What kind of life is that? God damn. It's the richest, coolest life I could ever have. And the men that have submitted to the process and done it, they have those same kind of cool lives too. And they get up in the morning like they, somebody put 220 right up their butt. And they're just like, yeah, there it is. I know exactly. I get up at 4 o'clock in the morning and I'm ready to go. I can't wait to get to work. I can't wait to get a computer terminal turned on so I can see how many of you guys emailed me. And I go, keep looking when we get back and talking back and forth like this. And you can tell me about how you're getting killed in the meeting. And I'll tell you what to do based on my experience. And then you can tell me later how it's going and then I can watch you walk free and clear of this deal and I can watch you stand shoulder to shoulder with another man and another woman and you can walk to the, to the wind-up joint or wherever you're doing and these little new buckaroos will come in right behind you and pretty soon they're sponsoring people and pretty soon they're sponsoring people and then you stand back one night at a birthday deal you stand just like this and you go, son of a 
Mitch, look at this. And you'll see all of these little buckaroos out there with all of them sponsoring people. You'll, you'll, you'll walk in a room someday and you'll go, oh, and you'll back back out of the room. And then you'll stick your head back in the room like this and you'll see one of the cats that you're sponsoring with a brand new little guy. And he's all tatted up and he's all pierced up and he's just sitting there and they're knee to knee and they got big books on their lap like this and he's carrying, your brand new guy is carrying a guy through the work like this. And I promise you, you'll do exactly what I did. You'll back out of the room like this and you'll weep. You'll simply weep because for the first time you'll understand the nature of the work that we do. You'll understand that you're a part of something that is huge, huge, and that you do indeed, regardless of the warts and everything else, you do indeed have the power to change lives on a cellular level. That's some heady crap for a drunk, some heady stuff. Thanks, guys. I love every one of you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.